This episode of the Round 6 Podcast is brought to you by Trailer Tug, the world's strongest trailer dolly. Learn more at TrailerTug.com. Welcome to the Round 6 Podcast, a weekly roundtable discussion featuring a variety of automotive subjects, interviews, special guests, and stories. Hosted by the Round 6 Gearheads, Brian Stubsky, Alex Welsh, and Brad King. Here on episode 54, the Gearheads are proud to welcome Pro Street legend, IndyCar parts mogul, and all-around nice guy, Matt Hay. Welcome to the Round 6 Podcast. I'm Brian. I'm Brad. And I'm Alex. And I'm Matt. Hey, there we go. (laughs) I knew that last name would come in handy. (laughs) That's all we've got tonight. Thanks a lot, kids. Thanks for having me. (laughs) That was easy. (laughs) See, I told you it's going to be quick. It it seems a lot quicker when you're on the air. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, because listening to it just drags on. (laughs) And with that, get out of my house. <laughs> oh, man. Thanks for coming tonight, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is awesome. We've been trying to get together for a while. We have. And uh, now here you are. You're you, ooh, you're in the inner sanctum. You are deep in the, well, I don't want to say deep in the bowels of the, uh, the <laughs> I feel like a movement. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I should have. I should have just left everything in that we were talking about earlier. Uh, yeah, it's so times. close. It was indeed. Oh, uh, yeah. So thanks for coming, though, man. Thanks for uh, braving the uh, the cross valley traffic. Oh yeah, intense. It was, it was pretty damn intense, yeah. Because you, uh, what? A, it's like what a ten mile trek. It took you about forty five minutes. Know, hey, <laughs> so... <laughs> Yes, it did. But it was the wrong time of night, that's for sure. Mm. I should have thought that through. We could have had you come by. We should have done this at like midnight. That'd been we'll, good. We'll do one of those next time. Yeah. We'll do a whole, uh, like a whole Halloween special. Ghouls and everything. <laughs> Ooh. A uh, Halloween special. <laughs> I'm going to dress as someone attractive. <laughs> <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> Yeah, you guys all bought all the masks. <laughs> anyway. Wow, this whole thing went sideways right off the Man. bat. This is awesome. And this is this is the most I've seen you in uh well, our whole lives really. In in the past like few days. I've seen you no, this is twice in like four days. It is. Good times, man. Yeah, it's definitely definitely. Yeah. Good times. Yeah, we uh, Matt and I went out for uh, for lunch on Saturday sat around and we we talked a lot about uh, this guy brad mm. yeah, yeah i'm gonna meet that guy sometimes last name slips my mind but yeah it was brad and, and the brad. last time we we met there was food involved so did you when he showed up you just hand him a toothpick or how did that or a toothbrush or how did that go <laughs> i handed him a check <laughs> there we were on my tandem bicycle riding through the end of the drive through <laughs> <laughs> so this is how this goes. Gosh, I've been missing out. I want to steer this time. Yeah. <laughs> Try looking up Brian's ass. Hey. Well, I think this is the first time I got the pleasure to talk to Alex. Yes. <laughs> you called yes. it a pleasure. Jeez, yeah. So are you disappointed or are you okay with it? Uh, no, no. no it's it's okay to be disappointed. <laughs> Try that 54 know. episodes and see if you yeah. still say the same thing. <laughs> anyway, uh, for our listeners who don't know, uh, Matt Hay, uh, name synonymous with uh, Pro Street Legendary. Huh? How about that? Is that even and, Dor- and Doritos. And Doritos. Doritos. Yeah, for oh, you yeah. stoners out there. Legendary. And rap stars. That, and rap wow. stars. And Backstreet Boys. Mm-hmm. And- Look at you, man. Just keeps going. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's, if I'm, I guess I could probably come up with better names to drop. <laughs> no, that's all right. I mean, what the Backstreet Boys? Well, it wasn't like the rapper. What what is my favorite name lately for a rapper? Lil Pump. Lil Pump rapper. Lil Pump is good. That's a solid name. Yeah. Well, this this uh, rapper Chance the rapper. He's a he's a pretty decent guy. I yeah. had no idea who he was when they uh, uh, started this uh, the commercial filming, and and uh, by the end of the night, you know, I thought, well, this guy's a pretty cool dude. And then uh, we did some you know reading and listening to him, and it's like, hey. Guys, legit. Awesome. So of course, we all know the Backstreet Boys. And, Not know. me. <laughs> I tried out. <laughs> <laughs> I said to stick to the Backstreet Alley, Matt. So uh, back alley. Back, so, well, since back we're talking, alley, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I tried to put, I, I, I thought he said back seat boys. That's why I put him on the back of the tandem bike. <laughs> I'm here till Tuesday. Try the veal. <laughs> hey, Alex, is it dolphin safe veal? Yes. <laughs> I'm the veal safe dolphin. You know, either yes. way. <laughs> Our veal was not caught in net. It's net free. Uh, veal. Veal. Net free. That's right. Yeah. Free it's range. It's never been online. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, speaking of speaking of the commercial, let's just start there. Heck with it. Um, so, I, I know the story, but I, let's pretend I don't. Hey, so how did you end up with the Doritos commercial deal? Well, on a serious note, we uh, uh, several years ago, we Deb and I were, uh, were fortunate to be able to uh, join a club out of California called the Television Motion Picture Car Club. We made up a bunch of guys in the film industry, guys and girls. Stunt women, stunt men, and producers and writers—just any guy that was in gal that was, you know, into the cars. And uh, they started. I'm not sure when they started up, but about five years ago, we joined, and um, uh, we were kind of got in because we were going to do a commercial uh, or a, a television episode for the NCIS uh, Los Angeles, and uh, that essentially fell through, but. Uh, they had our cars on registry and everything like that. So there's a, a fella that's part of the club that owns a, a company that supplies cars and props and things for the movie and television industry. And he had called me up uh, about a month prior to shooting a commercial and said, "Hey, we got this deal going that we might, you know, we might need the Thunderbird for this uh, shoot." And I said, "Well, that's great." And I said, well, "Is it going to be like a, a page?" you know, a picture uh, ad or something like that, or is it going to be a commercial? No, no, it's going to be a commercial. So, you know, all right, cool. So, and, and we've had about three or four of these that fall through because they, those guys change their minds overnight, the producers, or, you know, how they want something to go down, and, and, and which we've learned real quick. You know, just, you know, if we hear a deal, we say, well, it's not done until it's done. So he had called me then and said, hey, you know, they want your car, and they have a specific deal in mind, and so we – they gave us about two or three day notice when we went over to California and it was shot at the uh, Ontario airport in California. And um, we got there and said, Oh yeah, by the way, this is going to be for the commercial uh, for the Super Bowl." So it was like, yeah, that's awesome. And that's how that came about. And the rest is history. It was a fun day. It's about 16 hours of shooting and, and uh, a neat experience. Very cool. So and you've gotten a lot of feedback. There was a whole lot of uh, a lot of chatter about that online, to say the yeah. least. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's still a lot. I mean, last night I was watching it. It was just people are saying, "Hey, I just saw this ad on uh, TV because they're still running it. It was you know the commercial for the Super Bowl, and then it's on all kinds of other networks, and it's still running. It's on YouTube. Uh, almost 12 million views on YouTube. Wow. Yeah, was, uh, <laughs> for for corn chips. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, it's still run on television and guys are still posting things. Hey, I just saw this. And, and many of the people that see it don't know who the heck Deb and I are. They just say, hey, we just saw this Thunderbird Pro Street car, you know, and this is really cool. And, you know, didn't like the music so much, you know. 
that's just <laughs> car guys. But I, I tell you, really, not not being biased or anything, but I I, I thought the music was pretty good. <laughs> I thought it, it was really right. bad. I didn't have any problem with uh, it. it. It wasn't Barry Manilow, but it was good. Well, you know, <laughs> that's how we start every show here. <laughs> Slow dances with Brian and Barry. That's. <laughs> Aren't you glad you're in studio tonight? This is a. But. And we so do, we do care. We do karaoke after this is all over with, Matt. So uh, don't don't leave. Oh, okay, great. Nope, I've got my karaoke shoes on. Can you see? Oh, nice. <laughs> I got them for tonight. They're nice. For. Okay. Okay. Squeaky ones on. We're gonna do a chipmunk <laughs> song. Hey, I didn't understand why I had to wear a name badge. <laughs> Oh, you'll understand in about 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a reason for it. <laughs> Have some more water. I'll drink some water. I'm ask. parched. If you have to ask, you, you'll know. You look really thirsty, man. You should probably have some more. Why do I have this feeling at the end of the week? Brian's going to say, we had to edit the entire show. Can you come back Tuesday? <laughs> oh, you thought you were leaving. I mean, go go right ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah, he walks in. The first thing I said was, come on downstairs. Check out the basement. <laughs> Just installed it. Just installed it. <laughs> For me. She's like, what's all these chunks of concrete outside? I was like, oh, I put it in a basement this week. This is a slab yeah. home, right? It was. <laughs> so what was cool to me was when we were talking about the uh, the commercial over the weekend, you had mentioned that you were given a cool title. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> is... so had the contracts and all the paperwork and everything. And <clears throat> since they were, uh, you know, SAG, uh, Everybody has to be on legit. And so they made me precision driver. Wow. Yeah. wow. So I got to drive precisionally. <laughs> precisionally. In your in your own car. So there you go. Yeah. Yes, yes. I, uh, <clears throat> they, uh, there's a couple of guys that really, there were some stunt drivers there that uh, uh, worked on a lot of different movies and uh, television shows. And they were, they were pretty good people and giving me the ins and outs. Even though what I did and what you saw in the in the commercial itself was basically a straight line run, we did a lot of takes. There was a lot of behind the scenes stuff that they they didn't put to print, if you will, and they didn't show that. You know, at first I, I didn't know what I was doing, and then so a couple of stunt coordinator drivers uh, gave me some pointers. And they they volunteered. You said, you want you know we'll just drive. You know, want us to do it? And I looked at the other guy and this the, the lead. The lead guy said, "You know, Matt, if, if it was me, I wouldn't want anybody driving it by my myself. You know, I think you ought to do it." And I looked at Deb. She said, ah, "Go for it." You know, I didn't want to mess it up. <laughs> but it turned out it was. It turned out I'm. You know, I'm glad I did, and it was fairly easy work. It was just uh, talking with the uh, one of the uh, directors that was on the moving truck. You know, he's the, the driver said, "Hey, Matt, you know, give us a head start." Because you know, I'm sure you're going to come right out of the hole, and we're not going to be able to keep up with it. This is a huge movie truck, cameras. I think there was 11 guys on the truck that saw cameras um, hanging off wow. one way or the other. And uh, yeah, we counted 11. And um, so he said, "Give me a head start." So I let him take off, and I take off. You know, he thought I was going to like do some sort of a hole shot or something, and I just kept up. You know, go. I think we did 45 to 50 mile an hour. It was it was easy, but uh, the the kind of a funny thing was, is I was uh, constantly uh, in touch with him via you know a little walkie-talkie, and with the, the you know the roar of the Thunderbird sitting there just idling, and because I had the window, they wanted me to have the windows up, and I don't have a whole lot of insulation on the floor, so I was just kind of rumbling in there, <clears throat> and I saw the director starting to motion me to do this and go this way, so I pushed a button to talk, and I was like. Trying to listen, and you know, for the first couple of times, I just wasn't thinking. I had my finger on the button, and he's like screaming at me. I could see him, I could see him, but I couldn't hear him. <laughs> Pretty soon, he said, I could see, he said, he just was motioning at me, motioning. He's like, oh, yeah, take your finger off the, you know, the, I don't want to, I can't say it on air here, but, but, um, that was, uh, quite an experience. So, yes, precision driver, I did it without piling the car up or taking out anybody on the, 
All those years of nitrous holding on the button didn't didn't work to your advantage this time. No. <laughs> yeah, that was, you know, the final take of that was uh, fun. Uh, I think it was four or five takes. I still can't remember, but the last one I had the micro or the walkie-talkie on the seat, and right at the start, and he goes, and I, again, I can't say what he, he actually said on air, but he goes, you know, sink down a little lower in the seat, start bopping your head around like you're, you know, singing rap music, and then just start singing. And he said every nasty word. <laughs> and this is, <laughs> this is going out all over. The, everybody's got to walk to touch. So, you know, this is going out all over the place. <laughs> so uh, I said, okay, boss. And uh, that's what I did. At least you were holding the button for that. That would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I should have. <laughs> can, can you do a rap for us here on the uh, – Yeah. <laughs> can you freestyle one? <laughs> yeah. There, do you like it? Did you see that? That was good. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry we had to edit that out. Matt, it got a little dicey. I was wondering how they did it to where they made it look like it was Chance driving the car. Did they have you in like a Gary Coleman outfit or something? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, in the shot that you see me driving down the road, there's like three shots. There's more shots if you look at the YouTube version. But yeah, they, they put me in uh, the, the Chance's wardrobe person came up and she's a nice gal and she you know was putting her hat on me and and then she had this shirt <laughs> it's like i don't know if i can get into that but i put it on and it was it's a bit tight and we put the hat on they set it just now don't touch it that's the way we want it so i had to sit a little lower at the seat you Give your ears nice and tucked into a flat billed hat <laughs> yeah they, they break broke up the hot glue gun and put the hat on <laughs> Ow! Ow! It's yeah. perfect. Yeah, that that meant to uh, provoke the uh, rap song right there. Wardrobe comes over, and says, "So, are you a Raiders fan?" You're like, "No, not really. You are now." Yes. Yeah. Guess what? It's kind of built into the hat. Yeah, it was, a, it was quite an experience dealing with these people, but I'm sure they felt the same about me. So, like, oh no. I wonder if there's like an opposite version of that. Maybe someday they'll do a commercial where Chance the Rapper has to play you. And then be like, okay, yeah. here, uh, here. what I want you to do is want you to sit up really tall in the seat. Yeah. And you're singing a, a Pat Boone song. <laughs> Pat Boone, Barry Manilow. Wear this golf hat. Perfect. Yeah. Golf hat. Yeah. Visor. Song from South Pacific. <laughs> don't forget the pocket protector. Uh, you guys are, for those who don't know me, they're going to get a real rosy picture of what I look like. Oh, well, wait till you see what Matt does in the Photoshop. Yeah, it's no not... chance the rapper. <laughs> no chance no the chance. rapper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying you're white, but I mean, we, we turned the house lights down when you came into the studio. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good look on me. The reflection yeah. off of Matt oh, burned my shadow into the wall. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I'm so white I could catch a sunburn in a movie theater. <laughs> So, okay, well, let's we're gonna try to make some semblance of, uh, I don't know, some kind of logic out of this. So, <laughs> well, let's Tarantino this. We're going backwards now. Uh oh. So we've got uh, you got the the T Bird and a Doritos commercial. Mm -hmm. This is the second coming of the T Bird. Yes. Yes. Which is pretty. Pretty damned awesome when you get down to it. I don't need to tell you that. I mean, you've got the car in your garage. You know how awesome this is. Yeah, well, I tell you what. I think I told you the other day. It's um, Deb and I had no expectations the second go around. You know, we went back for the uh, the reunion at the Nationals in 2013, and we were one of the few guys that what they dubbed as legends. Made me feel old. <laughs> it's like legends. Oh, I mean, I remember reading books in grade school about legends. Oh. They didn't say relics. You know? <laughs> relics. <laughs> the, relics. <laughs> the relics of Pro Street. <laughs> that's good. That'll be next time. In fact, that's probably going to be this year. So, here we go. So, anyhow, we were we one of the few uh, uh, people that didn't have their original cars or one of their, their brand name cars at the event. And so, you know, everybody, what are you going to do? Where's this? What's that? You know, you're going to build another one. And, and, and uh, 
you know, it really, the bug bit us. And uh, I was kind of surprised that Doug, uh, Deb was really into it. She, you know, we kind of learned to cope with not being around this stuff for a lot of years. And um, so I can remember Sunday night after it was all over, we went back to the hotel room and, and, and I said, you know, should I build another car? And she goes, you better build one. You know, I thought, well, this is great. And then the whole night I was thinking, tossing, what do I want to do, what do I want to do? And <clears throat> in the past, I've always had what I wanted to build in my head, you know, 90% done in my head. And that's what we stuck to, you know, and that's what I would build. And I just, I don't know in this market what I'd want to do. So the opportunity came along to buy the Thunderbird. You know, I, I, I located it and it took a lot of doing to, to get it from this guy. He said, well, if I want to sell it. I want to sell it to you. So we ended up buying the car and uh, I think we got it fairly reasonable for what it is and what it was, <clears throat> but it needed a ton of work and a ton of money to, to get it back to where it was. So it was kind of a gamble. So we're just basically trying to do it to maybe just relive a little bit of the old days. And and so I get, I'm restoring the car, and, and I think it's about the time I took it over to Squeegis to have it painted again. They were the ones that originally painted it the first time in 88. And I, I wanted to call Ravel, because Ravel did a model of it in 1990. Right. And <clears throat> I wanted to call them to see if I could, if I still had the rights to any Ravel lingo or logos or, you know, talk about them or anything like that on, in, in print or, and I get a hold of this uh, gentleman and he goes, hey, I remember that, I worked on this and, and uh, I don't know, I'd have to check with legal on this, but I think all your contracts and stuff have been expired and, I, and I'm pretty sure they were myself, but I, you know, I wanted to try it and he says, but we're thinking about re-releasing your kit. I said, you're I can't believe it because I just bought the car back. <laughs> you know, so this is going to work out great. <clears throat> and he said, right you know, in a couple of weeks. So uh, a couple of weeks went by and he said, yep, we're going to go, we're going to redo it. He said they, they had all the molds. They still had all that. Yeah, but instead of molding it in pink this time, they uh, molded it in white uh, because I think probably 99% of the people out there that built it back in the 90s painted it more of a correct pink than the Ravel pink was. Right. So... That was that was fun, and then we and we got it done and took it back uh, to Decoin, Illinois, which is the big mecca for the street machine nationals, and, and we were received really well. And, and you know, I was surprised that a lot of people remembered us. I, I really was. I mean, and a lot of them were guys and girls that we didn't know. They were young when we were back there. I mean, we're talking eight, nine, ten, twelve years old back when we were doing it back in the seventies and eighties. And now they're all, you know, adults got their own kids. <laughs> they're bringing their own kids to these shows. So it was a little bit overwhelming. And then we just kept getting uh, other deals to do the car with. And, and uh, Jeff Smith, uh, he's, he was very gracious and did some nice articles on us, you know, some comeback articles. And uh, Toby Brooks uh, of with RPM Magazine. And Toby was a big, you know, he was a big contributor to getting the Street Machine Nationals back, you know. He, you know, he he worked hard to get it all back together, and then uh, he did some really nice ink on us. So, we, you know, it's not we owe a lot of people. We just didn't arrive. It was, you know, oh, I, you know a lot of people uh, made this happen as far as getting us back in the in the in the limelight, if you will. So, yeah, we did really well. At some of the events with some of the, we didn't we didn't go back to Winter Wars. We never entered anything. You know. That we've been there and done that, uh, but then we had a couple of nice surprises. Of you know, the car was 30 years old, and we won best engineered again. <laughs> you know, wow! I, I, I said, I, I looked at Dev and I said, I must not have seen very many cars here because <laughs> there's, uh, there's got to be something out there that's better engineered this thing. Yeah, but no, we we're fortunate to get that and a few other nice awards the second go around. So and then that's so awesome. And what we found out too is getting back a little bit to the Doritos commercial is the uh, one of the ad uh, uh, producers, art guys that was in charge of getting this Doritos commercial going, saw our car somewhere and he couldn't remember. I talked to him on the set and he said, "I, I just saw your car somewhere and I couldn't remember that pink Thunderbird is what we need for this ad with the flaming hot 
Doritos and all that stuff. We just that would look really good. And it is '80s. It goes back to the Backstreet Boys. It ties all together. And that's that's when he got a hold of Phil at the Next Pictures. It's his business. He said, uh, "Hey, I'm looking for this car." And Phil goes, "Hey, Matt's a friend of mine. I got his car." <laughs> it just, just so happens. Yeah, here we go. So, yeah, that's that's it. That could have gone a really different way had you sat down that night and gone, okay, I've got my idea. We're going to build a Corsica LTZ. <laughs> yeah. 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 Corsica. And, and we're going to keep it front wheel drive. That's, That's right. right. We're building a citation. We, we'd be talking all about the Depends commercial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I got this call to do Depends. Yeah, I'm Okay, in this next take, <laughs> sit really tense. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there's so many great builders out there anymore. You know, so it's not back when we were building it. It was a you know a group of guys and some girls out there that were just building cars. Where there's no big shops. You know, we were all building these things out of our garages. That was the cool part. That whole era was yeah. a lot yep. of like home built garage regular built. folks. Right. Oh, yeah, Deb and I built in the garage, you know, uh, Rick Doberton built in the garage, um, Rod Sabery, Scott Sullivan, Rocky Robertson, Mark Grimes. They were all, you know, we didn't have shops and employees doing this, and we just built, you know, in the garages. I, I you know, my garage door was my metal bender. For, <laughs> seriously, lift it up, slide a piece of metal between the slats, and sl slam the door. <laughs> it worked great. <laughs> In my eyes, the scrutineer, the scrutineer probably goes, oh, he's got a garage door. <laughs> gold chainer. Yeah, he's the gold chainer. He's yeah. his garage door. Yeah, yeah. But, he's you know, got it's too just nice a, of a door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's a term. door slammer. <laughs> there you go. Oh, That's where the term comes from. Oh, we got to That's right. got to play this out. <laughs> Doors. You can't do that with an electric garage door opener. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> In fact, I don't know. Brad, you were there. You, you noticed how I opened and closed the door by my hand, right? Oh, I yeah. didn't use a garage door because I unhooked it so I could do exactly what I was doing with the metal. I lift it up and funny. adjust a little bit and slam it in there. You need a good wooden door to do that these days. How many times did you crush your fingers until you figured out where not to put your hand? I did. I did. But no, it was, it was tricky. It was tricky. Yeah, seriously. Looking at Matt's hands right now, normally you say like sausage fingers, but that's all like pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> like flapjack fingers. Boy, you, can, you should see me swim. <laughs> uh, I, I was going to enter the Olympics, you know, but uh, that was back when Mark Spitz was big. Yeah. yeah they said, no, I was altered. <laughs> I was enhanced. <laughs> like a guy trying to hands. swim with two catcher's mitts. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Not today you could get away with it, though. You just told me you're an, an amphibious American. You know? That's right. I identify <laughs> a platypus. <laughs> a platypus. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Yeah, this is staying right on track. You asked me earlier, said you guys notes for you guys have notes for this. <laughs> a pity the fool has to edit this. No <clears throat> notes. That was question seven. This will be great. Yeah, for anyone listening out there, if you think this is like rigidly uh <laughs> written or planned. Well, I got a I got a question. We're gonna we're gonna get serious for two seconds here. Oh great. Just two seconds. <laughs> Okay. You 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 got into the pro street thing. That was that was kind of your uh, claim to fame as going the pro street. Why why did you go pro street and not and not build a street rider? You know, build like an early Ford or or uh, or something. I mean, obviously your Ford gigs. You got into the whole Mustang and T Bird and and that. Why did you decide to do a later model stuff instead of going to the uh, to the early stuff? Uh, I would you know I would say to answer that question right off the bat is when I was fifteen or sixteen years old, I was looking at old street rods you know american graffiti was out it just come out and just looking at I thought, this is cool and even though they were really cheap back then in the early 70s you know 32s and 33s and 40 fords and all those good things were it was still expensive to me i mean they were still a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars you know to buy ones <clears throat> and uh, i didn't have that kind of money and uh, so my first car was a 66 mustang and um 
I think that's what started it, just getting into the late model cars. You know, if, if I would have had the opportunity to buy, I remember looking at a, I believe it was a 32. It was down at, a, it was down at an old uh, salvage yard. The guy had it. He knew it was a decent car, and he put it and put it inside. But he pulled it out of these, this old salvage yard, and he wanted eighteen hundred dollars for it, which back then was all the money in the world. Like eighteen hundred dollars. I had eighteen dollars. You know? <laughs> Seriously. So too many zeros. Yeah. Yeah. What's up with the zeros? <laughs> <laughs> I looked at this guy square in the eye. I said, "What's up with the zeros?" <laughs> <laughs> so that's I, you know, '66 Mustang, and that's where I went. And from there, I bought a, uh, I traded it in on a '69 Mustang uh, that uh, had a 351 in it, uh, but it was shot. And uh, but I mean, it, it ran good. I bought it. It was a nice car, beautiful interior, and and uh, but it. Uh, the, the, the motor is gone. So a buddy of mine, Larry Hertzler and myself, we got it in our mind one time to put a new motor in it. So I got in the, the, the used car ads and found somebody that was had an old Cougar, 68 Cougar that had a 351 Windsor in it, I believe. And uh, we were selling that for like 150 bucks. So we went over and got the motor out of the car. And that was my first attempt to do anything mechanical on a car was swapping the motor. <laughs> I remember, <laughs> I remember, I was stumped. I couldn't figure out how to take the dry shaft off. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you were over your head from the very beginning. Oh, yeah, we jacked the car up, and I, well, first of all, I think this dry shaft's got to come off. And we looked at, I seriously yeah. kid you not, and a dear friend of ours, he's since passed, his name was Jerry Wiggins, and he let us use his barn to do this swap. And we wanted to do it in a, a night, and one night we wanted to do it, because I needed the car to drive the next day. <laughs> And he comes out, and he was, he was a gearhead. He knew what was going on. It's his child's play, and, and he shows me, he gets out, of, like I said, I think they're a half inch or 916, so his little nuts are on the, the U-bolts that hold the, the universal joint on, and, and yanks those off. And we, Larry and I looked at each other, and I was like, wow, that guy knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, wow. I felt like Owen Wilson. Wow. So I just... Went from there, and Larry and I worked on it the rest of the night and got it running by probably six or seven in the morning, and that's the rest is history. So, so we stuck with, the, or I stuck with the uh, late model stuff, and then uh, met Deb, and, and the rest is history. Man, so following that Mustang, let, let's say, well, whatever happened to that Mustang? That, uh, 69, I had all the way through high school. Had some good times in that thing, cruising town and all that. And then, you know, I had a buddy of ours painted. It was green. It was that uh, Mustang green, you know, that Mach 1 slash 69 green. It had a black interior, so I... Oh, perfect. Uh, yeah, so we painted it black. And back then, it was that's when art, uh, what's that, op art? Op art was big and right. scallops and fish scales. And this guy could do all that, so I had him do all that. I think he charged me 50 bucks for the whole paint job. <laughs> 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 and I got and a six-pack. Six <laughs> <Yes>. Yeah. <laughs> six pack. Brad, that's what you still get today, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, paint's a 12-pack now. It's, it's things, oh, you know, wow. economy. Well, you're, yeah, moving you're moving up. <laughs> so anyhow, I had that all the way through high school, and I graduated, and there was a, another night, uh, I was driving around town, and, that thing, and there was a, six, a, a 66 Mustang. Another one that was had uh, Vegas plates on it, uh, you know, in, in Nevada. And it was uh, the thing was it was that maroon. It was just not a spot of rust on it. And I go, man, I still like these '66s. So I remember putting a little note on it and saying, if you ever want to sell this thing, you know. And I got a call that night. And he said, three hundred dollars. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no. Three hundred bucks for a rust-free '66 Mustang, which was, you know, back then. Kind of in the ballpark, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> you know this, so I sold uh, the '69 uh, to a friend of mine, and, and I think I got fifteen hundred dollars out of that. So now, you know, I've got twelve hundred dollars left to make this '66 a beast. So uh, first thing I did with that is pulled the two eighty nine out of it and put a three fifty one in that one too, I believe. Yes, I think so. Yes. And 
that's back when Street Freak was still big prior to Pro Street. So we were, I got went down to the Fleener Auto Store and bought M50 14s and the lightest rims and stuff. <laughs> they were sticking out. And there's our first Hot Rod magazine photo was a picture of that. You'll see it. It's um, maroon. Show me your, pi- show me your picture. Show me your picture. He's yeah. holding it up right now. Yeah. Okay. There now, you see, go. See the gold reels. <laughs> I see that. They're center lines. And everybody thought those things were really bitching because they're gold center lines. Said, Where'd you get those? Where'd you get those? Did you have manadize? I said, nope. Uh, uh, I was friends with Fred Sibley and Fred Sibley uh, Sr. Jet Car fame. <clears throat> they lived in Elkhart and we'd go over there and hang out in a shop. And they, one of their big sponsors was VHT. And they had spray on VHT anodizing in all different colors. And they, they had stacks of this stuff because of sponsorship. <laughs> and I remember Fred, Fred Silly Jr. gave me a case of them. And I said, well, I could do the whole car. <laughs> cool, man, a nice car. I'm going to energize my whole car. Cool, this is going to be cool. This is all... And after about 12 runs, <laughs> I wiped them off. But, yeah, so I did the rims. And, you know, to this day, people are still saying, I love the gold anodized rims. And I try and I set them straight. No, that's just paint. But that's what it was. That's awesome. Though. So you'll see that. That's the one. See that I'm holding up the picture. For right. Your viewers. Yeah. With his left hand. That's right. Yeah. And for, the, for those of you that are using Braille right now, just. <laughs> yeah. You can kind of get the idea. But, <laughs> so that was, uh, I went back to the 66. And, and with that, I, I guess I left out of a little point. In that time when I was, it had a uh, 350, a 289, 351, and then I went ahead and um, the 351 was shot in a, in a speed shop in you know, local to us. It was a big speed shop, of, you know, in northern Indiana. And um, they, I got to know the owner real well. And a, a fellow of mine, a friend of mine had a 350 LT1 block that he sold me dirt cheap. And I said, let's do something different. Let's put a Chevy in this thing. So decided to do that and that was just prior before we tubbed it you know i think we awesome. had the chevy and the, and the fat tire sticking out the side of it you know for less than a year and then uh, we decided to go pro street which wasn't called pro street back then it was just i don't know if you called it tubbed it was just this you know car car with <laughs> big tires <laughs> under it you know, cars So that was leading up to the uh, Pro Street era. And we went down to the Street Machine Nationals in Indianapolis in 1978 was our first year. And uh, with with the Street Freak look on the 66. And I remember seeing two or three cars. And I think one of them was Scott Sullivan's Nova, the blue Nova he had, mm. which was, you yeah. know, that was the Mots. That car was everything you know i I think it it won everything too i remember and then which i thought was killer oh look look at those tires up underneath there you know that look but but what actually did it for me there was a some guy had like a duster down there and you know a stock duster i'm not sure what year they were but they're you know kind of a fastback looking thing and a stock duster if you look at that there's so much tire room you know wheel well there from side to side and and this guy had a tubbed one it was tubbed and that's that's what I told Deb. I said we got to do this. If he can make a duster look that good, <laughs> hey, 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 no, nothing. no. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about a stock duster. You know, that, you know I mean, I don't know. I, I had no friends that would say I'm saving up my money to buy a stock duster. I put some E78 14s on the back with white walls and hubcaps. I never yeah. say that. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, that that got me hooked on the on. The, Pro Street uh, movement, and you know things that I've talked to you on, Brian and, and uh, Brad is, uh, and Alex since you're here now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I I back then I was just getting on my own and and you know getting a job and working and stuff, and, and uh, I didn't have the money to buy that stuff, the, the rear ends and things. So uh, Jerry down at uh, Competition Engineering had a uh, Super Comp Corvette that was a pretty famous car. It won some, you know, Wally Awards and stuff, the NHRA events. He had some records and he wanted to get a new rear end. This was a Dana, Dana 60. And uh, he had a, he told me he'd sell me the rear end, the wheels and the tires. It was slicks. The 
fifteen hundred dollars. I'm like, wow, that's awesome because I was looking for them, you know, you know, to build one. And, and I, I thought, that's awesome, but I don't have fifteen bucks right now. You know, I was just getting by, and uh, that's when Deb uh, went down to the bank with her dad and co-signed the loan to get me that rear end. Wow, and, uh, that's that, cool. So that's when I knew she was a keeper. <laughs> <laughs> Prior to that, everything was up in the air. <laughs> no. You could take that out of context, and you could say, yeah. you know, it was, it was it was the rear end that brought you and Deb together. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> she had me by the rear end. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's that's got that, and I, for the first five years of Pro Street, I ran around on slicks, and we drove that car everywhere. They really did. I mean, if it was a long event, I, you know, I'm not going to lie to anybody out there. You know, there's trailer queens and there's trailer queens, and we've had our share of hauling cars on trailers. But uh, locally, we drove that car a lot, you know, in our town and all over, short trips here and there. And But <clears throat> if we were going somewhere a good distance, we'd put it on the trailer, especially since it had the slicks, because I've been caught in the rain with those. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sideways Ooh. down the road is no fun. <laughs> oh, looks good when smoke and tires, but when you got the brakes on, <laughs> no, no brake lights are burning and going sideways. Well, I, di I didn't know about this until Brian and I we were talking about this last night, and it was a Pro Street related deal. And apparently, there's there's rules with Pro Street. Is uh, is there like a rule book? And who started this thing anyway? Do you know? Yeah, I do. Uh, you know, it's it's as I was telling Brian the other day, I was a little hesitant. You know, I, I hate bringing it up in this day and age to other guys out there that are building pro streets and want to know this. And if you ever get on the internet and you see these arguments people have about what constitutes a pro street, it's like you just got to stay out of it. But <clears throat> it was um, started back uh, in the very early 80s um, by, by competition engineering. And everyone that coined the phrase, and there's a gentleman that uh, worked there that's become, you know, we became good friends over the years. His name was Fred Gurley. Probably still is Fred Gurley. His name probably still is. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Unless he changed it. But his, Kept his maiden name. This is good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, they want to, they saw, you know, these few cars out there that were tubbed, if you will, and they wanted to you know, do something that made them legal. So they wanted to, you know, they wanted to have all the aspects of a pro stock car because that's, you know, that's what I was trying to, you know, make was a pro stock looking car. Cause that was, those cars were just, they were my favorite drag cars back in the day. Cause you can relate to them and Chevy Ford, Pontiac, you know, dusters. And <laughs> but, Kind of go in the other room. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> hey. And that's when the podcast ended. Yeah. But so he, they, they came up with this ruling and, and there was an actual, you know, a list of rules and it was, you know, it, was, it had to be a street legal car, but it had to have all the safety features of a pro stock car. It had to be, it had to be tubbed. Uh, and, you know, it had to be, you know, primarily all metal car. I think there was, you could have a hood, glass hood, deck lid, and maybe a nose. I uh, can't remember for sure about that, if that was a deal, but uh, I know a glass hood and deck lid you could have, because that's the pro stock car, these guys could do that. And, but it had to be, you had to have a horn, you had to have wipers, backup lights, All obviously all your lights had to work. Uh, you had to have a fire extinguisher, uh, at least a six point roll cage, and it had to have mufflers. It really, you know, just, Everything, everything a race car would have. It had a window net, and then everything a, a you know a street car would have. Um, and the ruling, I, the ruling, fifty percent of the points was the registration. So when you went to these the pro street, you know, contest or you know deal, you could have the most bitch and pro street in the world but if you know you didn't have a, a, a you know regist registration or a legal license the plates had to be updated too you couldn't show up with a plate that was a month out of date they would just say well there's you'd knock you 50 points right there <clears throat> so everything was tight and like i was telling brian it's first second and third would usually come down to one point a piece 
I mean, that's how close it was. So swing out sidebar, everything. So I know myself and I know Rick Doberton and I can't speak for the other guys back in the day. I'm sure they did too, but I know Rick and I were always in competition. I was always trying to keep up with Rick. And so points meant everything. So I had this, I'm showing everybody right now. You see that? It's you know, it's the points and, and it's the rules and regulations. <laughs> it's fine print, squint. Here, I'll hold it up to the camera. So anyhow. It's like a three ring binder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three ring circuits. It's, 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 it's teal. It's got a pink stripe on it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's traditional. And Doritos crumb. Wrapped in tweed. <laughs> and so we followed that. And I, when I reconnect, I stayed in touch with Rick for many, many years. But since we re reconnected uh, last, you know, five or six uh, years ago, we, we were, he has still that list and he can't find his and I can't find mine and we're looking for him, you know. But we we followed those to the T. So that's, it was a deal. You know, a pro street car, that it had to have this stuff. Now you've got people calling, you know, pro street is pro street. Like I said, I can't even get into it. You know, if it's tubbed. They think it's a pro street car, or it might as well be because it is. You know, well, I'm not going to argue the points. But you know, like there's guys out there. Uh, you know, there's first of all, before I say anything, for every car Deb and I built, I've always said there's a 50 to 75 cars that were built better that same year. So I, you know, we were always just trying to do the best we can, and everybody's got their favorites, and everybody's got their cars that they just kind of like. Well, I wouldn't build that if it was me. But that's it, everybody does what they want to do, and everybody needs to, you know, really grab onto that and appreciate the fact. You know, if a guy puts his heart and soul and money into something, you have to respect that. And uh, so, but there's guys. It's a fine line. You know, what do you call a, a, somebody shows up in a tea bucket, you know, with big wide Mickey Thompsons on it, and he and he, and he enters it into the pro street competition. <laughs> you know, but, but we talked about that, and originally there were there was kind of a whether it was official or unofficial, there's kind of a rule cutoff uh, as far as years, right? Yes, yes. Because it had to be just like pro stock within, so you know, it had to be within the, the current body yeah, style. Could, exactly. Current body style couldn't be, there was, I can't quite remember how many, but it was just a few years. You couldn't be uh, over a certain number of years old. And unfortunately, one thing that maybe I disagreed with in all this was they had a, I think it was 60 eight and newer cars, which left out some great cars. Plus it left out during the time, you know, maybe fortunate because we were, Deb and I were very fortunate in winning Pro Street, you know, several times and along with other guys and girls, but there was guys that weren't able to even enter their cars like uh, Rod Seabury's 63 Vet. That was, thing was killer. And then, uh, you know, Scott Sullivan's the, the 67 Nova. No. <clears throat> Maybe, you know, I'm not going to speak for them. Maybe they wouldn't even entered in it. But, you know, if they had, those guys probably would have won hands down. Those were fantastic cars. And that's a car that's that was just made to be, you know, tub now. But wow. Mm. So, yeah, you leave out all those early ones. I mean, imagine if somebody would have taken the time and built, like, an orange-colored 55. That would have set the world on fire. Yeah. With no seatbelts. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, jab. <laughs> <clears throat> no seatbelts. Scott, if you're listening. <laughs> but by the way, Scott, I'm reading off a script here. They're making me say all this stuff. Uh, in fact, who is Scott? Oh, Scott. Read this or the yeah. dog gets it. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, now, weird, weird question on that, though. Because I always thought about this. You had kind of like the cars that were at the, the top of the Pro Street chain. And, and for a while, there was a whole flood of like Berettas. And cars like that that were just really cool looking now when you start to open it up i always wondered if it was that whole dare to be different movement when that kind of hit the magazines you know everything had to be oh everything is just different so it was grab the goofiest possible car you could and it seemed like the recipe for the day was whatever you could find if it was like a bullet nose studebaker oh, yeah. a nash anything like that yep. throw the fattest Absolutely. tires underneath that you could and that kind of became like synonymous with pro street for the longest time yeah that that movement came out really right at the end of our first go around. I think we got our last event that we attended with the Thunderbird was a ninety or ninety one, 
Yeah, so that was right about that's right at that point. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And there was then this bullet to nose Studebaker. I think that was real nice one out of Tucson or something. The guy built. And then of course uh, all the Troy's cars. You know he, he oh, yeah, Nash yeah. and all those cars. The Buick, sixty uh, came. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the Buick, fantastic cars. But you're right, that movement came along, and that was uh, that was uh, they were pro street cars, but you know just a whole new. A whole new different look because it got away from the Mustangs, Camaros, and all that. But essentially, that's one of the reasons we built the Thunderbird <laughs> to get away from the Mustangs and Camaros and the Corvettes. And every, I mean, there were so many nice cars out there. We had to do something different. Same with our Oldsmobile. You know, it just it was like the competition. And it was we were all such good friends. I don't think there was any animosity among any of the guys. No. And another thing, it seemed like back then, people weren't trying to build something that looked like your car or his car. Everybody wanted their own identity. Nowadays, a lot of guys, they say, well, I want something that looks just like that. Absolutely. You're right. Everybody, we wanted our own identity. Uh, we all got along. And if we did have an issue with somebody, we kept it to ourselves. You know, I mean, obviously, every once in a while, I'd have something, you know, like uh, bothering me a little bit. <clears throat> Usually not among the... Uh, pro street fraternity or something but somebody would say something about our car and then i'd like to, I'd like to say something back you know and it's like you know i had so many guys walk up with their girlfriends and say hey see that thunderbird there i built that car i sold it to this guy and you know it was just what happened with the thunderbird and happened with the olds and happened with the he was just out you know trying you know and it was a gauge for us to how how well we did because if the girlfriend goes uh then we knew we didn't build the right thing you know <laughs> right <laughs> But the girlfriend liked it, then we knew we built the right car. Yeah. But yeah, it was, you're right. Social media, everybody was trying to be different. The dare to diff, you know. Uh, you guys were ahead of that curve. You guys were different before it was like, it seemed more like, it, you guys were the dare to be different crowd. Because you guys took, a, like, that's hell, who takes a, a you know, a Cutlass Sierra and, you know, tubs it out? And I do want to talk about that car because there's great stories in that. But. Yeah. You were doing stuff like that. I mean, so that wasn't a dare to be different. That was just go out and try to be different. You know, you kind of looked around and said, "Oh, cool. So you're building, you're building a vet. Cool. You're building a a Beretta. Cool. What can I build that's different?" Right. Then it seemed to be try to be different is what came out. So that's when you had to go and be like the strangest kid on the block. You were looking for the weirdest thing. You're like, "Oh, I've got a Henway." <laughs> but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 It was, it's kind of weird that, uh, well, I was always looking for something different. That was the, uh, idea, not so much with the Chevy motor in the 66. That was just something that, you know, at the time we weren't even in pro street and I really wasn't even, you know, in going to car events. It was just to do something local to go cruise our town. And, uh, so, but the six or the 79 said, you know, okay, you know, we gotta do something different here so that, you know, we put a Chevy in that and that. You know, raised a lot of flags with you know Chevy lovers and Ford lovers, and that was the perfect car. That I, I'm not trying to rub salt in that wound. I know you're looking for that car, but that car, that that's the one that that really turned me on to those. I never looked at a, a Fox Mustang before that. Well, just didn't care. And I saw that car. And it sat so low, and the wheels didn't sit way inboard like some pro street cars did. You know, you could tell the guy who just went overboard. He mm -hmm. was like, well. The rear needs to be narrowed four inches. I'm going to narrow it yeah. 12. <clears throat> yeah. I want to be able to get the tires off without jacking the car up. <laughs> well, that was, that car was, we, as we discussed, that was a simple car. It was, you know, it had a, it had a Alston chassis in it, but it was, you know, it was a arm suspension out of a Mustang two. And just, that was big. Everybody was doing that. And, uh, you know, of course it narrowed her in, but it was an economy car. Cause you know, I built it on a budget. I think I built the whole car for, well, thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars. And I painted it myself. <laughs> Everybody goes, yeah, we know. <laughs> <sighs> What's that run in it? Oh, that represents my sprinting days. But uh, yeah, you know, it was that was where we. I really wanted to start something. That I want to put a Chevy. And one of my favorite stories with that car, and I wasn't even there to witness it. Rick Dobberton. This is right before I met Rick, and we were at the Street Machine Nationals. And he was, he's a Chevy guy, of course. And there's so many Chevy guys out there. And I, I was pulled but up. Not, not a lot of not a lot of duster guys. No, no, just a few. One cool duster, though. Did I ever tell you about this? 
Yeah, I was I was driving the car, the seventy nine with this mus or the Chevy in it, and I was pulling up to the side of the road to park it. And this is what Rick told me. This is what he heard. He heard a group of Chevy guys or a group of Ford guys. I'm sorry. He goes, "Oh, look at that man! That's Ford power." Because I had the hood on it. <clears throat> And oh, that's, that's awesome for that thing. Kick the Chevys, you know what? And Rick knew it had a Chevy in it. And I, <laughs> and of course, I went to take the hood off. <laughs> and these guys, they had a cow. And Rick was just laughing. He said, Yeah, yeah, really badass <laughs> Ford car. <laughs> you know, so that was the start of doing something different. And then getting into the Oldsmobile is I wanted to find. Now, there's guys, and I can't remember the. Uh, Drag racers, but the, in the seventies, mid seventies, early seventies, all the way through the mid eighties, late eighties, I followed NHRA a lot. I think a lot of guys did. You know, I, it, the pro stock cars looked like a car you'd go by and build. And there was guys I think it was, had cars. Uh, Buddy Ingersoll, I think, was running something like that. It's uh, yeah, Warren Johnson had one. Warren Johnson, Warren, right? Yes. Yeah. And there was another uh, another. Uh, Johnson, Tommy John, uh, Tommy Johnson, or somebody like that. Not the, the 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 father of Tommy Johnson. Tommy Johnson went on went on to run uh, fuel cars, I think. But anyhow, and I saw a couple of those, and I thought oh, they're kind of neat. But I just was bent on going out and finding a family front wheel drive car, and really tossing the dice. So went down to Edwards Oldsmobile in Phoenix, and there was this bone stock white Sierra. And uh, I told, I, as I recall, I told the salesman what I was going to do with it. I don't think he believed me. But we bought the car <laughs> with the intention of taking it straight home. So no Scotch Guard, huh? No. no, no. <laughs> what was that thing? Try to sell you? Arizona. Oh, they man. try and sell you something out here all the time. Shoot. Arizona protection policy oh, or something from the sun. The Arizona yeah. protection yeah. policy. We'll pass. We'll pass. <laughs> yes. I just go and put a big old cream coat of cream uh, suntan lotion on the car. It works just as well. So that was the deal there. We drove the car. I liked driving it because it was nicer than anything we ever had. It was this brand new car, you know, zero mileage. So we drove it around for two weeks, literally getting groceries, going shopping and stuff. And then it was time to take it home and hack it up. So, Do you remember the last place you took it when it was stock? It's a weird question. Yes, I took it to... Uh, a newly built high school, Corona del Sol High School, which is just half a mile from my house. And I think it was on a Saturday or Sunday, and then nobody was in the parking lot. And I said, I got to take a picture of this thing, bone stock. And, and the thing is, I wasn't smart enough. I could take, gee, I could take a picture of my driveway. <laughs> Seriously. And I, I got that picture. In fact, I, I think some of you have seen that picture. Of stock. Oh, you're not going to hold that one up for the viewers, huh? Well, actually, I didn't bring it. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, he's, got, he's got this trifold display though it's pretty awesome it's like a, it's like a science fair brush <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> done on construction paper yeah it's just the history of pro street street yeah. was spelled wrong he, he filled that in really nice though yeah, street doesn't have three e's i was gonna say who knew it only had three e's <laughs> street a street. <laughs> And then as we, were, oops, we were talking earlier is um, I uh, Deb and I when we first moved out here I got the car and we were renting a house for close to a year I think and we got the we worked a little bit on the on the uh, Mustang the '79 Mustang in there but we started to cut the uh, Oldsmobile up in this in this two stall garage this rental house and. And the landlady would come by at least once a month for inspection. <laughs> Do we like cobbling it back together so it looked stock? Oh, <laughs> and I, you know, she saw this brand new car, chop shop. You know, no wonder. I saw you're making payments on your rent. <laughs> oh yeah, it came out of Tijuana, so, yeah. yeah. But yeah, you know, it was funny. And, and, and the neighbors, I always had neighbors stopping by. There was a guy that lived right around the corner from us. His name was Bob, and I, I forget his last name. So if you're listening, Bob, I apologize. But I used to call him Tea Bucket Bob because he drove a tea bucket. And he'd always come by and watch the progress on that. And then all the neighbors would be fascinated on what I was doing to this brand new car. But the, uh, about halfway through the project, we moved just 
a block away into this new home home division where they're building homes and the house had a three-star garage and wow god three-star garage you know i feel like a mega <laughs> shop now wow i could actually have room for my sanding blocks and my bondo and so we moved there and i put the car on a trailer and hauled it over there because it was just the frame and the chassis at the time or the, the chassis and the uh, body so and then we got a whole new set of neighbors that looked at us sideways <laughs> <laughs> uh, the clamp it's just moved in yeah well you know we, there's this <laughs> this sweet lady she's an older lady she used to walk by all the time and she would stop by i just marvel at the different type of cars you have in your driveway <laughs> and she, one time she came by and i don't know um for you tv viewers out there and uh the rest of you guys you, you three uh, you all, Rick Dobertson's, you remember his surfeit or orbiter that he built out of a milk tanker and drove halfway what? around the world? Yeah, right. Well, right. He, part of his leg was coming through our Phoenix, and he'd call me and uh, say, hey, I'm going to be going through Phoenix. Where do you live? So he came by and spent the night at our house. Of course, this milk tanker assault vehicle was parked <laughs> in front of it. And then he was, <laughs> There's a submarine in the driveway. <laughs> You never saw that old lady again? Yeah. Yeah, the Nautilus. And then, of course, I can't go into it. This will be your job someday, but getting him on here and tell you, have him tell you stories of that thing. But Me uh, too. Yeah, he's got some crazy yeah. stories. But, yeah, there's people that just had no idea what this thing was. I mean, it looked like one of those, you know, a police, you know, it could be an yeah, armored. Like a, big, like a battering ram. Yeah, that yeah, thing. A assault vehicle, you know. <laughs> battering ram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Full speed, Scotty. He, he yeah. tubbed that in 92 as part of the <laughs> Dare to be Different movement. Yeah. Yeah. You got a lunar orbiter? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just happen to have one. <laughs> so we have some strange things in there. Of course, now we have the Indy cars that are sitting out in the curb in the driveway. And But now everybody's pretty much of a solid core group around there. We don't get many new neighbors for whatever reason. <laughs> But um, in fact, when somebody sells a house or putting a house up for sale, they always go, Matt, Matt, we got some people. Can you keep your cars inside? Because we're going to really try to sell this house. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. If I went looking for a house and there's a guy with the Indy cars See? in his yard, I'd be like, tell the wife. Yep, we're moving in this <laughs> When I was looking for a house. Right here. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah, we, have a, we live in an HOA, so every once in a while we get letters. I haven't recently, but I've been trying to be good, but we'll get letters from the HOA. Put your toys away or you're going to get fined. I love that. Yeah, like you need more money for the HOA. I wonder how many kids I've put through, like, probably not a good school, maybe like a community college, just with the fines. Oh, yeah. 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 I feel like Milner. <laughs> put that in her CS, opens up the, the glove box, and all these things fall out. I'm going to go to sell this place. They're going to be like, uh, you know, there's been like 14 liens on this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all over a weed <laughs> right a weed you know that tree in my front yard brad that that's <laughs> didn't start as a tree that actually is a weed <laughs> <laughs> really they had fruit no man it's a weed. if you knock on it it's still hollow <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh man uh, so okay, the uh, oh my god, the old the old was really good to you guys as, as far as coverage went. I mean, they, yeah. it's so funny how this is something we kind of touched on too. The era you built that car in, there was a whole lot more. Um, that's what I'm looking for. Like maybe positive energy from sponsors or companies that wanted to be on board to kind of co-market with you. I mean, it, it was a whole different ball game than it is today. I mean, today it's really tight and rigid. Uh, just, just for comparison's sake, is that something you want to talk about at all? How you know how for that sure. kind of went? I yeah, you're mean, right. Uh, once the '79 was out there and it did fairly well for us, and you know, the magazines and awards and stuff, and, and anybody that's involved and gets those things will testify to that. You know, it, it puts you up a little bit on a another plateau to where you're able to do some things that maybe you can't do when you're first starting out, like 
for the first eight years of Matt and Debbie, you know, fifteen dollar oh, yeah. budget on it. If you go from you know no stereo to a Craco stereo, to all of a sudden you've got Soundstream in it. Yeah, that was that was a yeah. different world. So when we started the Oldsmobile, you know, then uh, we we were fortunate enough to have people contacting us, manufacturers, and we did put our feelers out and we sent letters and went to SEMA show and introduced ourselves and. We were very fortunate that uh, most everybody wanted to jump on board with this. It was big. The SEMA show is, is always big. But it seemed like the 80s, you know, was really taken off with the direction of the Pro Street. And, you know, the guys, you had companies starting to manufacture narrow rear ends, you know, and, and you had Alston chassis and all, you know, and it's Mark Williams. Everybody was into this, you know, the, 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 a lot of the guys were building Pro Stock chassis and stuff were now, you know, supplying them to the Pro Street. So what was that like for you? Just just a weird aside. I don't want to cut you off, but you go from an era where you were buying, you know, the rear end out of an X drag car with the slicks and everything. To all of a sudden you walk into a place like the SEMA show, which not to make you feel old, but being a Pro Street legend, at the time the SEMA show was held in like I think it was room fourteen at the uh, the Flamingo. Just just moved down the street from the dunes. <laughs> It was an up. This is an adjoining room. It was great. <laughs> it, oh, that's when they expanded. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Bathrooms are still closed, though. Seen, yeah. but, we were doing uh, SEMA last year. It was awesome. It was in two rooms. <laughs> you should have been there. Huge. Oh, you wouldn't have fit. <laughs> <laughs> what car was on display? Whatever was parked outside. <laughs> it was outside. The valve stems were inside. <laughs> Not at first. <laughs> but the, um, so how do you... It's got to be weird, though, to go from an era or, or at least a point in that time when you're trying to source parts out of existing drag cars and things mm -hmm. like that to suddenly you can go into a place where you can buy a narrowed rear end or anything you need out of a catalog. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. And it, it's got to be so weird, you know, because in a way you're like, you know, hey, we, you know, back in my day, yeah. we had to. You know, Which, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> Which back in my, that was the early 80s, and back in my day, and that's Chevrolet, not that long ago. That's, I know. That's crazy. Yeah, it's, you know, a SEMA show is a good you know, good place to do that. But then, yeah, they, all these companies started just coming out with all this stuff. It was it was available to everybody. Uh, wonderful, you know. And, uh, we would We would take our accomplishments, if you will, to the SEMA show and, and, and show them these people. And if they wanted, they would want in on the next project because it was all down to, you know, <clears throat> dollars and cents to them. You know, I don't know what, I can't remember what it was, but to, to you know, a, a quarter page or a page ad in Hot Rod or Car Crash was tens of thousands of dollars, if I remember right. And they, they, they might supply any one of us. I, you know, a lot of the builders back then had to, you know, the ability to go in and show their, you know, show their accomplishments to these people and, and, and get people on board with them. So they were able to supply us with maybe five or ten thousand dollars worth of parts that they knew that were going to be on this car. And this car would be at the SEMA show next year. It's going to be in hot rod, car craft, popular hot riding, super Chevy, super Ford, blah blah blah, whatever. And then of course, any other magazine that came in from overseas. There's always these guys from uh, the UK that would come over. Australia. There was an Australian street machine magazine that would always come to our house. You know, it's crazy. They'd fly in and take a couple shots and leave. Like, wow, that was quick. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> but but uh, that's that was it. You know, they would just want in on the projects that were happening. And, and you had to show them a track red record. You know, they knew that we would be going here and there. It was it was it was a dollar and cents thing to them, and they would get involved if they felt it was you know good for their business. So we always tried to make them happy, you know. So and then that went rolled in. That was with the uh, a lot with the Oldsmobile. Uh, uh, they wanted, what are you going to do this different? What are you going to do? And I said, well, you know, it's going to have Lenko, which is you don't see too much on the street. That back in the day, I think Lenkos are everywhere now, you know. <laughs> but oh, yeah, I've got, I've got one of mine. Yeah. yeah, well, that Duster had one. But uh, <laughs> I got three on the tree, Linko. <laughs> so, but you know, and then another thing was is uh, I wanted to go with an alcohol car. You know, burning methanol would be different. You know, so I wanted totally. I wanted a, a 
front wheel drive family car converted to rear wheel drive with a bone injected small block Chevy on alcohol with a Lenko <laughs> for the street. <laughs> it ran cool. Of it never got hot out here in Arizona. The, the, it's funny, it's another story we could talk about later, but the heat did affect the performance of the motor a little bit, but the, it, as far as you know, the injection system, but it was just, it ran cool all the time. So, But it was a different, we wanted to build something totally different. <laughs> this is such a cool deal. I mean, and that, that body style lent itself perfectly, though, to being tubbed out. It had just the right amount of weight in the quarter panels. It just had that right look yeah. to it. I, the only modification I did to that body on the Sierra was... Uh, I stretched the rear wheel well six inches at the, you know, right at the center top and moved it back six inches and then had to take the whole rear flare and move it back on the quarter panel. But that was the only thing, you know, because it just, you know, with the, the Mickey's under there, it just didn't look right. It had to be opened up a little bit. Yeah, a little tiny on the wheel opening. Yeah. So it looked, it looked better that way. So that was the only body. 14s. <laughs> <laughs> That was, we had a lot of fun with that car, you know, just showing it. And then uh, it had, uh, getting back to the thrush mufflers that were on it. Um, yes. We would. Uh, very, very big with the, uh, the duster crowd. Yes. It was, uh, <laughs> we would drive that thing. Of course, at the Nationals, if you're not on the highway, you're cruising around the fairgrounds at, you know, turtle speed. And uh, so the, the alcohol, would, you know, it, would, it was running a little rich and it would build up. Always, I mean, I'd look in my rear view mirror and almost always when I'd come to a stop, somebody would look underneath the back of the car just to see where we were in. And then I'd whip the throttle. <laughs> and you should see all the guys were rubbing their eyes and running away and putting their shirts over their faces. I mean, it was, it was classic. You know, that's back when you I, video cameras would have been great. But seriously, that was the, one of the, the, the fun things to do. Is, is, uh, what did you do for entertainment? I mounted a GoPro on the back of my car. <laughs> <laughs> Blind to the locals. But that thing drank so much alcohol. I mean, it was like, it was like a great friend. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, you, know you know, Jim, you just. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but you were buying every round. <laughs> good point. Good point. Oh, I'd buy it by the 55 gallon drum. Literally, it takes several drums of alcohol with me to these events in the trailer. And then wow. I had those racer i think they were uh five gallon or six gallon eight gallon uh, those plastic jugs that all the drag guys had i bought a whole bunch of those and then mm. i'd fill them all up and like the morning of the first day of the nationals i'd go around to the vendors this is when there's lots of vendors around you know i'd think i'd go over to this guy or alston's or i'd go over to bds or you know whoever b and m and i'd hey can you store a, a jug for me <laughs> And all over the fairgrounds. So no matter where I ran out of fuel, I had fuel. <laughs> and I ran out plenty of times. Because it only had an eight-gallon fuel cell in it. Oof. And it would just go through that fuel like crazy. So, yeah. So definitely not a reacher, huh? It wasn't the kind of car you were going to hop into. and uh... Yeah. No. Maracruz. No. <laughs> Maracruz, yeah. Why is that car on a trailer? <laughs> but you, I probably all you guys remember that ill-fated Hot Rod Magazine uh, article they did, um, Who's Kidding Who, with our car and Jerry Marlin's 40. Right. That was done in the heat of summer in Phoenix out, out by Firebird. And the whole premise of that is, and I, they didn't say it was going to be called Who's Kidding Who. Um, I'm sure they sold it on. It's going to be a great yeah, overview on well, these two cars. The guys that were involved at Hot Rod that were doing it, and I didn't know at the time, but, but they were kind of down on pro street you know they were more they, they they were trying to read through more like what should be more of a driver and you know and it is what it is but so they get a hold and they we go out to the drag strip and jerry's car if i remember right was more of a racer than mine so we get on the strip and it was bleeding hot out there i mean it was we were sweating bullets and you know if i remember right we're Paired up at the uh, on the lights there, and we were idling because they were getting trying to get the right light and the, you know the photographer setting up and the right light. And in the meantime, it's super hot and the alcohol fumes are just piling up inside these thrush mufflers of mine. Just you know, <laughs> <laughs> 
And as soon as the light turned green, I nailed it, and the thing exploded. I, I still have the muffler. It split completely in two. See, in fact, here it is. Let's wait for this. This the boomer that yeah. made the news oh, here. Yeah, it, it blew the muffler, split it wide open, blew up the bottom half of all the floor pans on the one side. It's the driver's side, oh. and burned up a bunch of electrical wiring and everything like that. Oh, you know? so that was that as far as that you know we just put it down the after that the thing was still running but we just put it down to the end of the track <clears throat> and if i remember right jerry's car did pretty well i mean it wasn't a blistering car he, you know it wasn't set up for all that drag because we, our cars were supposed to show up there drag and street so but then when we went out driving um in the desert roads is two lane roads out there i probably still are except for the main deal there is we you know we did pretty well we couldn't go very far but the, the car stayed cool and i think jerry's car struggled a little bit in the heat you know so we both had our problems but uh, the uh, magazine just focused on the problems <sighs> and uh, i remember running into the uh two of the people that were in charge one was the publisher at the time a hot rod uh, or editor and uh the other one was one of the main photographers. I ran into him that later that year at SEMA. We just didn't have a very good conversation. <laughs> but, you know, the, but you know, I got to give them this. Uh, and there was plenty of flack, you know, in the response editorial the next couple of months after that. Yeah, I know those cars. You know, they, they're all you know talk and know this and that. And you know, we got we ate some crow there. You know, the car just did not perform. And you know, I could blame it on the heat. I could blame it on the mufflers. I could blame it on a million things. But the bottom line is, it just didn't work like it should have. So I decided not to. I thought it decided to give up the alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Got off the wagon. <laughs> yep. Give up the alcohol and move on. But yeah, so yeah. that was that was a. You know, Moreland's on. car is back on the street again. I heard that. I heard. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Lorenzini's got it running. Yeah, it's it back on the street. Thing. It's a driver. Yeah, it's a cool car. Yeah, it is. So speaking of back on the street, whatever happened at the Oldsmobile? What became of? <clears throat> well, there was a brief time that we owned. We built the Thunderbird while we still owned the Olds. And Orion Stereos used the uh, Thunderbird for some promotions. And I just, I think I told one guy, I said, I got this Oldsmobile that, you know, I was, I sh they, they knew the car. And I took all the magazines and stuff down there, you know, the sales pitch. And I said, well, you know, if I can sell you this thing, paint it, do whatever you want with it. So Orion, Orion bought the car from me. And then they painted it several different times over a couple of years. And they used it for promotion. <clears throat> and probably about four years, five years after that, which after Deb and I got out of Pro Street altogether or out of cars for a while, they uh, offered it back to me, sell it to me. I think I could have bought it for like $20,000 or something like that. But as I explained to you earlier, Brian, it, they'd taken the, the uh, BDS supercharger off of it, put on something different. They took the Lenko out of it and put in an automatic, which I don't know why, because they never really drove the car. They said, oh, it makes it easier to drive. <laughs> It wasn't hard to drive with a Lenko. It's just like driving a three-speed stick, right. you know. Uh, but anyhow, uh, and I, I, I had the money at the time. I just didn't, had no interest in buying it back. You know, we just sold the Thunderbird. And it was all like, we're yeah. done. Plus, with that many coats of paint on it, you know, it, it rounded it off. It looked kind of like a new Taurus. <laughs> <laughs> the paint was so thick, there was no door handles. No. <laughs> I didn't know they made a small back window, Sierra. <laughs> Opera uh, up up window. That's, <laughs> up right, that's window. right. Sierra. Nice. Well, the reason, the reason I brought that in was that, that was my pathetic attempt at a great segue here. There's a story about the Orion amp in the T-Bird. Oh, yeah. This is, this is, a, this is an interesting story. Uh, the amps that, were in this, that uh, Orion put in the car in, in 89, I think it was. 89 were their best top of the line. They did a whole system in it. And it was, it was stereo sound. They had a Kenwood in it and they did all their speakers. And but the amps were, you know, what we were shooting, you know, really pushing. And they were using our car for display and, and promotion. And 
it worked fine and we sold the sold the Thunderbird and of course we bought it back in 2013 and when I, I didn't care about the stereo when we got it back didn't work it just it was for what I didn't know if it was a loose wire or the thing was burned up I didn't care I wanted the car back I wanted it on the street you know I wasn't gonna listen to the stereo much anyways so probably two years ago after everything else has been done I thought, well, you know be kind of need to get this system running again you know this antique little antique stereo <laughs> And, you know, you know, he's got... Antique. You know, well, yeah, you know, there's a place to put your 45 in it with that little spacer thing, because, you know, I put the needle on it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, most of you guys know I'm an antique guy. You see my phone. This is an antique from the era of Bermuda shorts. It's, it's <laughs> hold hold your flip phone up to the camera. There, Can right. everybody see my flip phone? It's still <laughs> okay. in operation. All right. All right, there we go. There we go. You see it? All right. Good, good shot. <laughs> Funny thing is, I'm actually holding it up. I was going to say. <laughs> well, I'm a visual, physical guy, you know. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm holding it up from Brian. <laughs> hey, Brian, see this? I'm doing it. I'm acting excited. Was that, was that a good look? It was. <laughs> it was yeah. Okay, seriously. <laughs> so, uh, I, I decided I want to do stereo. I couldn't find anything that made this thing work, you know, work. Yeah, I didn't. The lights would come on, but nobody was home type thing. And it, so I, I got on eBay and started looking for amps. And then, you know, anybody that had parts of these amps, I can't remember the part number of them, whatever. And, and I'm looking for the uh, preamps and then the other little mixer dude, whatever you guys call those. Things. Crossovers. Crossovers, yeah. Uh, and there was one guy, and I, he was like in New Jersey or something that, uh, there's plenty of guys out there that had crossovers, but they're all like used, no guarantee. And I said, well, I got one of those. <laughs> I got used with no guarantee. <laughs> you know, I'll sell you mine. You have two. <laughs> That's my middle name. <laughs> <laughs> so I finally found one that had uh, like a, a year warranty on it or something. It said rebuilt warranty. And, and I, I didn't know where to start, if it was the amps, the crossover. But so I'm, I'm just going to do this. So I get on the internet and I'm continuing to look for crossovers and parts and pieces and the only thing I come up with a crossover and a fella in New Jersey had one with a I think he said a year guarantee on it <clears throat> so it's a start and I was writing him emailing him back and forth what I was looking for and he says he, he says give me he give me a call he sent me his phone number so I give him a call and he goes well I used to you know do a lot of Orion stuff and whatnot <clears throat> so he said what you need to do is get a hold of Bernie Bolin. Bernie Bolin is, was one of the co-founders, if not the co-founder, of Orion Stereos. Now, he had just left prior to before I started doing some uh, promotion work with Orion. So I, I didn't know him personally. We met a few times, a couple of deals. But, so bear this in mind, for the probably I don't know, a good couple of weeks, I was searching all over the country in Canada for these parts for this system. And this guy in New Jersey says, well, you ought to get a hold of Bernie Bowen because he's the one that designed all that stuff. And I said, well, yeah, it'd be great if I could find him. He goes, well, you should just get a hold of him and, and uh, see what he's got. And I said, well, do you have his information? And he says, yeah. And he gave me his phone number, and I recognized the area code. Jeez, that's Arizona. <laughs> you know. And he goes, yeah. He said, where are you at, Matt? And I said, well, I'm in Chandler. He said, well, I think he's out somewhere near you. So I call him up. And again, mind you, several weeks of looking all over the country and literally Canada for parts and thinking, you know, where am I going to find these things? I call him, and Bernie Bowen has a shop two miles from my house. <laughs> two, two miles. I mean, when I drove over there, I looked the odometer. two miles to his doorstep. And... Uh, we, you know, we caught up on old times, and he said, uh, and then and he said, I'll be over to your house uh, next couple of days. He came over and looked at the system, and he said, just pull everything out, pull everything out, and bring it to me when you can, and I'll go through it. And he was kind enough to do that. He dropped what he was doing. He's in the middle of uh, a new amp that he was designing, getting ready for his release for the CES show, I think. And he called me up, I think, a couple weeks later and said, it's ready to go. And I said, what's wrong with you? He said, everything was dried out. He said, all the diodes and whatever things. So all, all those moving parts in an amp. <laughs> yeah, all those <laughs> widgets and gadgets and things in an amp there were all dried out. And they need replacing along with your uh, all the parts in your 
preamp and your crossovers and things. And I said, where'd you find the parts? He says, he literally, he went on a site, it was antique, antique uh, audio parts. That's where he found a lot of this stuff. But he, he designed these amps, so he knew exactly what he was doing, you know, 30 years later. And uh, he got it all back. So that's part of the whole, I think it's an interesting with the with uh, the Thunderbird, because, you know, having the guy that originally designed those amps for Orion actually rebuilding them 30 plus years later. So cool. It's, it's kind of like Squeege painted the car 30 years later. They, you know, the same same guy painted it. It was restored in the same garage that, uh, you know, we built it in. <laughs> so, as you can see, my life's kind of boring. 30 years later, where'd you, you know, go back to a high school reunion? <laughs> yeah. I'm still in the same garage. I've got dirt under my nails, paint in my nose. Looking at antique stereos. Yeah. Still can't weld. You know? <laughs> Everybody else is doctors and lawyers. And... <laughs> oh, well. Your your other sideline, though, if you want to talk about that, the uh, the IndyCar parts deal. Yes. Um, that's, that's been a fun business. It really is. You get to meet a lot of people and do a lot of interesting things. I got into that. I've. My dad got me into the Indy 500 back in 1964. You got none of you guys were probably even born yet. Yeah, we no. were. Well, let me tell you, the Indy 500 is a. Race. Oh, those, those two were. <laughs> hey, 64 was a bad year at Indy. Oh, well, bad year! My first year, and I saw two drivers lose their lives right in front of me. Dave McDonald, yeah. Eddie oh, Sachs, yeah. yeah, and they went yeah. in the worst of ways too. It was, it was yeah, it was awful. But anyhow, um, so. I always was into Indy cars and this and that, you know, Indy 500 and playing with the toys and building the models and little gas powered cars. Uh, and then it got into the memorabilia end of it. You know, you could afford to buy this or that or ticket stub or a picture or somebody's autograph. And then um, 19, uh, excuse me, around, uh, I don't know, 90, 95 or 96 or something I had somebody had a Alice or juniors 87 Indy car in the, in the paper for sale I was always looking for deals of cars in the paper and I went out and looked at it and it was a March uh, it was a type of chassis with a yeah. Cosworth in it and uh, it was uh, I think it finished fourth that year his dad won his fourth Indy that year and little Al won uh, or took fourth Anyhow, so ended up buying the car. I thought it was it was expensive, but I thought it was a good deal. And, you know, I bought it just for a memorabilia piece. To wow, you know, I got this indie car in a garage, and I've always been a little Al fan. And uh, after just sitting for a while, kind of got boring. Actually, you know, I mean, what do you, you know, if a car just sits, you know, I couldn't really go out and run it or anything. It was way too expensive to keep it, keep up. So you turned it into a front wheel drive family car. That's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. Seats. Put a slant six on it. <laughs> slant six out, out of uh, Dave Ramsey's uh, duster. <laughs> but I'm sure he made a profit on it. So, <laughs> Celebrity yeah. indie car project. This is all the makers of a great TV show. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so anyhow, that was my first experience with an indie car, and I ended up selling it. And then um, went to an auction that was advertised uh, back in Indianapolis. Uh, it was a charity auction. Uh, and a lot of the teams were yeah, they were either they were putting stuff up and it was a charity auction, you know, race suits and car parts. <clears throat> and uh, the chassis manufacturer, Raynard, that was out of uh, where the hell did you know? The UK, England, they uh, had a bunch of obsolete uh, nineteen ninety four to nineteen ninety nine Indy car parts that they just donated and they you know. And I bought some of the parts, and, and there was a, a girl there that was, uh, she had a Raynard shirt on that uh, she was t keeping track of this and that. I said, you may want this stuff. And she's in the very young. She goes, yeah, yeah, we got a whole bunch of stuff we need to get rid of. we got a warehouse. Their main North American Raynard uh, warehouse was right in Indianapolis. <clears throat> so I thought, oh, that's cool. And I bought a, a handful of stuff at the auction, and then I went back to Arizona, and, and I said, man, I'd like to. I wonder what they got, you know, I'd like to, you know, the parts business would be kind of neat to get into uh, selling to racers with the older cars or memorabilia or guys want wall hangers. And, and uh, so I called them up and she said, well, we got a, all of our, our entire uh, inventory from 94 to 99. 
and this was in 2000, 2001, so they were getting rid of their old stuff. She seemed to come back and look at it, and I got back there, and she was very gracious, and, and uh, one of the uh, uh, managers, if you will, came out and said, well, Matt, you know, we just can't piecemeal this stuff. I just don't want you buying this, buying that. And I don't blame him. Nobody wants that as a customer. You want to sell it all. So, you know, I said, okay. I said, but since I came out, I drove back there. I drove back to the truck and trailer. There was a, uh, that wasn't, was, excuse me, it wasn't 2000 because uh, Peterson Publishing put a reunion on for guys like me and Sullivan and Saberi and Doberton, all those guys. It was a, a reunion deal. So we were honored. It was kind of neat. Uh, Peterson was there. and uh, But that's why we drove back there. And, and so we went over and went to this Reynard uh, warehouse. And I got a few parts. They let me buy a few, and I took them and put them in the trailer and took them back. And when I got back there, there was one of the rear wings was missing an end fence, or the end plate that goes on the end of it. And I called up Melissa. That was her name at the Reynard. Says, I, really, I know I you can't do this, but can I buy the other wing to this so I have a complete? She goes, Well, I'll do you one better. <laughs> and I, I know I told Brad the, the pricing on this, and I won't go into it, but they, they said. If you cut us a check and we have it here by tomorrow, you can have the entire warehouse full of inventory for this amount of money. And this was a case in point where there was a lot less zeros than I expected. So I told Deb, I said, I'm cashing everything we got. <laughs> I got to go to the bank, got rid of it. And, and I had him a check there by doing the next day Jeez. and uh, bought this, you know, entire warehouse full of so I went back there with a truck and trailer and I made fortunately my brother lives back there and he had a, a barn a farm and he had a lot of room to store parts <laughs> I, I told him where afterwards you know what they ask or do it first and ask for forgiveness <laughs> later or whatever the saying is so he let me store it I made many 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 trips back and forth to Indianapolis and stored all the stuff up there so that's what got me into the parts business very and, cool and and after that some of the race teams heard about it and they started they were calling me hey we got this inventory we got this inventory so I was buying stuff like crazy and in this business you have to be Johnny on the spot it's you know if, if I got a good customer and I got an X amount of parts and I run out of those parts it's not like oh, I'll order another one out of catalog or let me make you a piece they're gone they're you know like any old classic car you need there's only so many original pieces built so I have to buy when somebody says, hey, we got an inventory, you know, and, and it's usually, you know, cash. They want cash and you got to do it now and you got to take it all. So you're getting stuff that you've already got 30 or 40 or 50 of just to get two or three of the other pieces. But that was, that's pretty much how I got into it. And then it got into the cars. I started buying cars and, uh, you know, I didn't even had anywhere from 10 to 15 Indy cars at a time and rotating them back and forth. I had them stored. I had them stored in Indiana and out here. And there's a guy, there's a carbon fiber guy up in Phoenix that stored a few for me up at his shop. A neighbor stored one in his garage <laughs> for me, you know. So, yeah, yeah and uh, it was just uh, for a while, it was, it was really good, you know, buying all this stuff up. And now I'm trying to taper back quite a bit. But it's a, it's a fun business. Interesting. Right on. <clears throat> I'm down to two cars. One that uh, I, I you know I drive, and the other one's it's completely disassembled. It's even the steering rack is disassembled. The you know <laughs> it's completely disassembled. But you know if if you know if a customer wants it, I could have it put together in a week's time. You know, less motor. You got some cool stuff, I will say. But, you know, touching on the IndyCar deal and getting back to the, uh, uh, the Television Motion Picture Car Club is, you know, when I first uh, met the guys and got into the club, getting back to what I said earlier, they wanted to use the IndyCar for an episode of NCIS LA, and which is really intriguing. Uh, the, uh, the producer called me up. And I said, what do you have in mind? He says, well, what we want to do is it's an episode where this girl car thief steals a race car from a racetrack and just drives down through the streets and trying to get in there. 50 cop cars are chasing them through the streets of LA. And I said, oh, that's cool. I said, we're going to actually, yeah. So what we want you to do is drive this car, you know, she says, how fast is it going? I said, well, it's got a small displacement motor in it right now. It's not fast. Oh, I mean, in the gearing, blah, blah, blah. I said, oh, that'll do, that'll do. And so I, uh, 
Well, I was stoked about it. I said, well, I want to be the driver. He says, we can do that. We can have you drive, but you're going to have to put on a blonde wig and sit low in the seat. And I went, this will be cool, you know? Sing a Britney Spears song. And they literally block off down, you know, the streets in L.A. And I go, <laughs> they said, just drive as fast as you can and get out. You know, you know, we'll chase you, the stunt drivers and cop cars. Well, unfortunately, there's a few events that... Uh, came upon and i didn't know this till the i mean the night before we're getting ready to leave the producer guy called me and says it's canceled um there's some other situations that came up and and then they filmed the car they filmed the whole episode later with a cobra you know a shelby cobra which you know my eyes is it's cool <laughs> you know, that's pretty I mean, cool you know, I mean, if you're, you know you replace the indy car i would you know i fortunately i was friends with uh carol shelby and and so it was kind of like that would really be cool. Is that, you know, I'd like to go over and watch this deal and stuff, but we didn't go over. But it was a fun deal. But prior to not prior to knowing that we weren't going to do this episode, is I didn't know what the limits were on this car, on a street course or a street service. You know, going around a through in an oval like at Phoenix International is what it is. You go around in circles till you get dizzy. This I wanted to see where my limits were and how fast I could go slipping and sliding before I hit a curb. And uh, fortunately I didn't hit a curb, but so I got this thing out and it didn't have, I don't think it had much, it, it didn't have the nose on it. And uh, so, you know, kind of looked a little funny cause I, I didn't want to bang up the nose. Those carbon fiber noses and wings are extremely expensive. So I was going around the neighborhood, sliding this and doing this. And I, I couldn't get it to slide too much, but it was, it was and my last take, I'm going around, and you know, lo and behold, there's this uh, police officer. I, there's a there's a three way stop. I come up to, I, and I stopped at all the stop signs. I was obeying the law in this car, but I stopped, and here she comes. It was a female. She and I just, I she looked at me, and I just saw the evil eye, and I pulled the car to the curb, shut it off, pulled the steering wheel out, and climbed up climbed out of the car and she just kind of pulls up and rolls her window down she goes i don't suppose that's legal is it and i said no said, you have a registration i said well, no it's not legal <laughs> you know and and she just no humor you know i thought you know i have all the respect in the world for police officers and, and female police officers i just you know really respect them and i thought well she's really gonna hammer me on this and she just said i just don't want to see that driving anymore you should keep it off i don't want you to start that thing up i want you to take it home you know it's it was if i recall it was a 115 degree day and i'm in my i didn't put my driving shoes on because i didn't think i'd need i just driving in my socks <sighs> and it's you know black top around the house so the neighborhood so here i am pushing this car in my socks <clears throat> and it was it was a bit warm and uh, I, I probably pushed the thing. I don't know. Way, well, you know, Brad, you know the way out over there. I can't. Oh yeah. Where that, uh, that long strip. I don't know. Is that a quarter mile or? Something? I'd have pushed it till I saw her disappear, and I didn't jump in and take yeah, it well, off. That's exactly what I did. Not. I put, she she parked out the other street, and she kept watching me. She was parked. In, uh, I pushed it around one corner. I pushed it around another corner, and once she couldn't see me anymore. And obviously, I got a self-starter in that car. I jumped in it and hit the ignition. It fired right up. And I drove it home and went right in the garage. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so but that was something I was trying to do to get ready for this film shoot, you know, for this episode because I didn't want to. I had no idea what the limitations were. This car driving it like a maniac through streets. So that was interesting. It's like a full-on die thing. Every everything you ever wanted to do as a kid. What do you want to? I want to drive. A race car through the streets of LA and have cops chase me and not actually go to jail. That's yes, right. And get paid for it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm in. I, the I, irony of it. The irony of it is here I am practicing around my house. I get the cops chasing me. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a real deal. And it was a girl with blonde hair. I was like, what? <laughs> I tell you. And you know, you know that there's somebody listening to this podcast is like, well, my dream was just to put on a blonde wig and drive around in a car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Matt did that. He just wanted to do it with a race car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good times. So it was. Uh, it's been a long, fun, strange journey. You know, like I said, uh, certainly Deb's been a big part of making it all happen. You know, 
Definitely. It's, you know, finances are huge to, to build cars and play with cars and do stuff like that. But I think it's, you know, just equally as important to have somebody, you know, support you as much as she has. You know, it gives you, it really, you know, gives you the uh, support and the backing you need. And now there's been times that uh, she's... <laughs> <laughs> Not all kind perfect. Of, kind of, yeah, I mean, kind of looked back and looked at me sideways, but it, it all it's all worked out well. And, and we're still doing it, you know. We 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 took we had a little hiatus and took some years off, and we got back into it. And not quite as many events, moving quite slow. <laughs> which which is good though. And like you guys were so much fun at the uh, the Hot Wheels 50th anniversary thing. Oh, that, yeah. was, that was such a that was fun. God, that was that was a tough layout there. Speaking of being hot, I mean that was oh. that was a hot day. <laughs> yeah, up. Yeah, that was a crazy oh. and yeah, and such a diversity of vehicles. I mean, I think we were parked right beside a, a lifted truck that was got to be three stories tall. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was afraid of wind is going to blow over on. T- <laughs> it's like it was top heavy. Center center gravity was way off on that bad boy. Yeah, it was a fun deal. It was kind of cool to hear all the people walking by who there were there were people who recognized it. There were people who'd never seen it before. You know, you hear people making comments about it. It was really cool. Mm-hmm. Not not a negative word. Everybody's just like, this is the coolest thing. Yeah, that was that was much appreciated. It was uh, I, I do I truly like the people the enjoy the people that have never seen it or don't know what's you know, talking to them about it because it's fresh to them and it's fun to just tell them about it and then you get the guys that uh, swear that we built the car after the Ravel model came out. Like Ravel designed this car, and then we built a car to look at it. You know? <laughs> and uh, of course, and sure. you know, at some point you just kind of want to go along with it, just like I did when the guys would show up and tell their girlfriends, "Hey, I used to own that car. You know, I built that car." And you you kind of want to go along with it, but uh, I, you know, sometimes you got to be serious. That's... Okay. That, gotta you know help out and that's i think that's one thing that we're looking into to more uh, or more is kind of on a charitable aspect you know you just you don't want to die with all this stuff you know and there's there's guys out there that really appreciate what we've done and they've let us know about it and of course with social media now they you know it's you see a lot of this stuff so there's some guys out there that Loved the Thunderbird when it came out, and they still love it. So there's, and and, and the Oldsmobile. So I got you know a plethora, a plethora, piece, plethora, plethora, ooh, plethora, more piece. plethora, yeah, a plethora of parts and pieces and things from the cars or something that had to do with the cars or awards or something like that that I'll never know what to do with. So I give these things to these guys, and they just think it's great. You know, tires off the Thunderbird that were you know, I mean, way cool. I mean, if it just you know. Parts and pieces, license plates, uh, articles of clothing, you know, that were. Uh, yeah, well, I do appreciate you leaving the pair of underwear that you wore when you were building the ch- the cage for the car. Oh, yeah. On my couch, yeah. I, You're yeah. welcome. It's stuck right there. <laughs> Thank <didn't> you. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so looking into that, you know, I don't know. And if they like it, fine. You know, you know if they don't, you know, they, they, they just love this, the, the memorabilia of all the, all, the, all the pro street stuff back in the day. And so I try and do that. But. On a serious note on that is doing stuff for kids um you know if deb's a you know a children's pastor so if there's children you know kids at the events we always you know try to spend a lot of time with them you know and not only handing out goodies or something to them or free posters or shirts or something but uh you know doing something meaningful and, and we're looking and i you know we we talked about this last week about doing something, something, trying to get up a fundraiser type thing, a charity, a charity that would go to different, you know, charities for kids. I'm a big proponent of, you know, animal shelters and things like that. Okay. Too, so I don't know if it, you know, I have the moxie to pull something like that off. You know, there's there's guys with, you know the celebrity to be able to do that stuff and they can raise a lot of money where, you know, we're just in a certain genre, you know, and if we can find people that want to get involved in that with us and we're all for it because, you know, I, it's time to start giving back, you know, to everybody's, that's, you know, 
out there and it's appreciated what we've done and then of course to the kids or the shelters or whatever out there let's talk off air about that all right um, you can that's something we can make happen yeah, that's some good stuff heck yeah it is hey <clears throat> next year we're going to have a raffle for the thunderbird 50 cents a ticket awesome no limit <laughs> So the guy that buys the ticket wins. <laughs> no, you know, a lot of things cross my mind. And you got to be careful, or I do, because I don't want to come across as like, well, everybody's going to want this thing, you know. Right. Like I said, there's, with the, the cars, the quality of cars that were built back in the day and that are being to, done today, and there's always 75 cars better than ours. That's my, you know, theory on this, you know, or, or more that if anybody would even care about this stuff, I mean, that if it's worth something, someone, and then that, that money can go to help someone, and that's, you know, call it a home run. Hey, hey awesome. Brian, we're going to find out where he bought the raffle tickets at, and we'll just buy a roll so we have <laughs> we have the number. <laughs> we'll just split it. We'll just take turns driving it. We'll, we'll, we'll be good. This will be awesome, man. Let's see. I get to drive it home. Well, okay, wait. We gotta, we gotta talk about it. But we, we just it was an closer. idea. <laughs> <laughs> I live closer. Oh my gosh! Just a stone throw. What's that? Just a stone throw. Exactly. Just stone, unless you're in traffic. Yeah, forty-five minutes and ten miles. It's perfect. Well, that's how I got that nick in my window. Somebody actually threw a stone. <laughs> <laughs> it was Brian. I, I wouldn't do that to you. As far as you know. Uh, as far as you need to know, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks for coming over tonight. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. yeah, Matt, thank having, you very much, thanks dude. Thanks for having me. It's fun. Yeah. Oh, we'll yeah. do some more. <clears throat> and there's a million things we could have touched on, but maybe this gives everybody a little idea of who we are. Well, yeah, so, so I guess it's time for you to move your tassel to the left side of your fez. <laughs> <laughs> done, done. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll be in the outtakes somewhere. Um. Anyway, thank, thanks for coming over, man. You bet. Thanks for having me. It's been uh, it's been an experience. Right. Well, thanks. Man. Love sharing stories. If anybody wants to listen, I'm sitting here, <laughs> sitting here in the to the, show your pictures and yeah, yeah. get your oh, shirt and my nice shirt I wore. I shaved awesome. a couple weeks ago, so <laughs> yeah, <that's> nice. <laughs> Didn't look like he had on a uh, you know some kind of a, a hairy turtleneck, which was nice. You're wearing a sweater. Uh, no, I don't know. Yeah. It's one of those fake turtlenecks that you tuck in. Yeah, yeah. It's a... Couldn't have afford the real deal. Is that Angora? No. It's just me. It's an Armenian sweater. <laughs> Angora. I got an Angora. Armenian sweater. <laughs> oh. Uh, it's, it's been good. It's been uh, good to chat with you, Alex. Yes, sir, as well. And look forward to meeting you. Absolutely. And lots of things coming up this year. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can't we, we can't mention been. the one thing quite yet. I mean it'll be it'll be interesting that half of what I told you tonight's even true. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that that's kind of not a good thing that we fired our fact checker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of great stories out there, you know, as far as what we've done and, and over the years and building cars and things that we can share next time. It's uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's hard to put a, a lifetime of fun into what's been four hours. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, four think hours. about this. Well, hey, uh, thanks again for stopping by, man. Thanks for coming here, uh, hanging out in the sweat box. Formerly known as uh, Problem Child Customs Studio, now known as uh, Round Six East. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Of course, appreciate it. Yeah, we'll get you back in. We'll talk about the stuff we kind of talked about off air. Sure, that's fun. Yeah, you know where I'm at. I know exactly where you're at. I'm going to come over and bug the hell out of you. And hopefully, I'll be around for another couple of years. That'll so. be good. I plan to be around a couple more weeks, so this is going to work out fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know you're nervous when your elderly dog might outlive yourself. So yeah. Every day I look at you, oh, no. I got oh, the well. dogs oh. usually out there just divvying up my stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good times. Best of luck to you guys with your podcast and all your endeavors you got coming up. Well, thanks. Thank you. 
Oh man, we're trying. I do know all. I do know all the way back from our commercial shoot in California. We listened to your podcasts all the way back. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> yeah, it was a rough. I drove, and I I had headphones on. <laughs> I kept looking at my flip phone. She had one of those new gadgets, a smartphone. No, seriously, this you know, it's it's good stuff. Well, thank you. And now you're part of it. That's right. Look at that. You're part of the lore. You'll like never listen read. to it again. <laughs> Never listen. I know I won't listen to this one. You gotta, you, gotta think, you gotta think this one through. You're like, do I share? I'll the ride home with me. Do I share this with her friends? Do we just ignore it? Yeah. Do I, yeah. What if I could get on another podcast that would publish before Friday? The lost episode. <laughs> the lost. The stay lost. <laughs> stay lost. Well, hey, thanks again for listening. Um, again, man. Uh, as always, Pro Street. Indy car parts mogul, all around nice guy Matt Hay, live here in studio. Well, live for me. You, you poor bastards, you weren't invited, so you'll be listening to this later. So that's what you get for not being a Patreon sponsor. Uh, <laughs> Deb sends her regards. She would like to have been here. Well, thank you. We, yeah, seriously, we, we, next we time for on. sure. She had a prior engagement, and uh, but. Uh, we would love to have her on because she's a big part of everything that you do and you've done. And mm -hmm. we want to have her back on to get the truth about all your stories. So. Yeah. <laughs> <No>. Right. <laughs> it's probably a good thing she wasn't here. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, though. Thank you again. Uh, as always, at the end of the episode, I am a, uh, I'm, 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 I'm a slant six powered Brian. There you go. I'm a much narrower rear end Brad. I'm a less fezzier Alex. <laughs> Catch you guys next time. Hey right, guys, take care. Thanks. All right, we'll Thanks. see you. Good luck. Good luck tomorrow. Great. Alex. Right, thanks, Matt. Right, take care, Brad. Hey. Thanks again for listening, and be sure to keep up with us gearheads over on our website at www.round6pod.com. If you'd like to, we invite you to follow along with us over on Facebook, Instagram, and be sure to check out all of our latest videos on YouTube.com. Big thanks once again to our sponsor, Trailer Tug. Please visit them at trailertug.com and learn more about the world's strongest trailer dolly. Our listeners receive 10% off their order when they use the discount code ROUND6 at checkout or when calling their order in. There's a lot of New York guys that died that were in that, in that commercial. I don't even know where they came from. We were sitting around with Matty and Matty Matt, Matt, Matt kept asking for food. And then, and then, and then, <laughs> Matty. <laughs> Matty. <laughs>